We're going to talk with Hal Hartley, writer, director, and composer, and he has a new project. It's the Henry Fool Trilogy, and it features his films Henry Fool, Faye Grimm, Ned Rifle, and it's a box set and subtitled in five languages. Hal, what was it like to go back and revisit these films? The principal discovery was Henry Fool, which I shot in 1996. And it came out in 1997, 1998. In the months I spent uh, remastering the film and making it high definition from its original 35 millimeter masters, the uh, interpositives and stuff like that. You know, I worked on it for weeks before we actually even brought the sound into it. It was just working on the image, you know, and then we brought the sound into it. And there was so much that I had forgotten about what I had written and what had been performed. And it was kind of interesting to see how nothing ever changes. What I was writing a little bit about in some of the secondary characters was the swing back to the right with the what was called back then the Republican Revolution and we invented a character named Owen Fear who was like you know just trying to scare everybody all the time about everything you know that was during Bill Clinton's administration it's really kind of shocking to see now how similar it is to the president we actually have and all the nincompoops around him so uh that was kind of shocking. Uh, it was much more obvious with Faye Grimm, you know, where I was writing that after 9-11 and trying to make a film about how difficult the world was to understand uh, once everyone got into a warmongering mode and, uh, you know, and then espionage in reality became an everyday thing for everybody. Uh, uh, you never know who was, a, you know, messing with your mind or you know whether it was cnn or you know actual spies you have to yeah. and then ned rifle finally after you know it's just i wanted to kind of bring it down you know to i don't really think the world is kind of relaxed at all but i I wanted to start the film with a, a young man who was, like the times, very pent up, and righteous, and unforgiving, and show how he becomes forgiving and uh, begins to rethink his uh, violent impulses, his you know righteous violent impulses, and it's kind of just all came, came down to you know. A place, man, you know, a calm place at the end. You know, not necessarily comforting, maybe not restful, but uh, an attempt at clarity. In looking at these films, or this trilogy, let's say, does it resonate with what's happening in our current environment? I, I think so. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, it's very close to me, so I might not be the best person to uh, give an objective answer to that. But, you know, for me, yeah, it seems like I say on the Kickstarter page, it is, for me, it's, it's as a nonpartisan kind of person, it seems to be the best I can do to render an image of what uh, being an American of a certain class and stuff like that uh, has been like for the past 20 years. Um, yeah, like the the Grimm family, who are the center of the story, they're basically decent people. They're, they're white trash. <laughs> they're my <laughs> representative American family. You know, my interests have always been a little outside the mainstream, and I'm a little bit... I think maybe I expect a bit more attention from an audience. It's not like passive. You know, you can get kind of irritated if you just want to be entertained. You know, (laughs) but uh, but I don't think that's a bad thing. But I also, I always like to let my audiences know that, you know, when I introduce films personally in movie theaters even, I just tell them like, you know, this might, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff here Mm -hmm. and it's okay to laugh. So it's great that it's, cool to have a good time but it's also going to demand 
a certain degree of attention that uh, you might not be <laughs> willing to, you know, give it. That's cool. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to be a teacher or anything like that. You always get fascinating actors in your films. Is there a, a specific quality that you look for? And when you see somebody, do you do you, do you test them, or is it just from a meeting? I mean, how do you go about? with the casting process to find those people that are just right to make up the characters in your movies? Well, I'm a very careful casting director. I mean, I, I consider it like 95% of what I do as a director is, you know, just getting the right person. And they got to look right, they got to sound right, they gotta have to be able to move right. Sometimes I'm taken by surprise. Thomas J. Ryan, who plays Henry Fool, who immortalized Henry Fool, mm. he was really not the kind of actor that I generally move towards. And he was, like, really surprised when, because we were friends and I, I watched him on in theater plays all the time here in New York. And we had a lot of friends in common. And when I asked him to read for, uh, Henry Fool, he was like, wow, that's odd. I'm not... At all the you know back then that was the late nineties. I guess everybody thought like everyone had to look like Martin Donovan or you know the girls need to be Adrian Shelley or something. Like that. <laughs> but uh, but there was something really fascinating about how Tom moved, although he didn't feel like confident in it. Uh, he didn't think he moved well. Yeah, he didn't, that, that Tom's of course a tremendous vocal actor I saw something and I I, I just threw my uh, my money down on that <laughs> and and it worked he was he, he got a very engaging funny physicality but you know physicality and ability to speak those are the two things that all actors who you know, have a good time working in a film with me. You know, Parker Posey is probably the best example. DJ Mendel in my film, Meanwhile, and lots of other, he's, he's in some of these films too, the Henry Fool films. The people who are just incredibly physical and incredibly verbal. They have a real command. Like Parker understands the rhythm of my language better than anyone. And I can write for her and know that, you know, she'll be able to interpret it. You also had an opportunity uh, to work with Isabelle Aubert. That must, have mm -hmm. been, that must have been very exciting for you. Yeah, that was terrific. Uh, there, you know, we, the trick there was to try to figure out what, what we do with my language when it's being filtered through somebody's second language. I think we did a good job there. I mean, she, she's brilliant at analyzing those kinds of things even by the time she had worked with me on amateur in 1993 i mean she had done other movies she's she acted in german she acted in french you know of course that's her language but you know she but she found ways into the english which surprised even me that must be exciting those discoveries when an actor finds their way into your material and something is discovered that maybe you didn't think was going to be there. That's the foundation of the connection I had with Martin Donovan in those films in the early 90s, mid-90s. Uh, Martin's like heartbeat is entirely different than my heartbeat. He reads a sentence, even if he doesn't change a word, if it doesn't do anything to the language I wrote, where he places the the breaths and the emphases and stuff it's just not what i hear in my ear so it's always a little troubling at first but it's the beginning of a great adventure how was it uh having jeff goldblum in uh your film he was in uh, fay Grimm, right totally excellent <laughs> it's just a, he's uh he's a joy to work with and uh, he was one of the first people who put into words something, if you can believe this, after like 20 years of making films. When I met him, he had read the script to say Graham, and, and the first thing he said to me, he says, like, you move people around and make them talk. That's what he said. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's probably a pretty good, to 
description of what I do as a filmmaker. He says, I love that. I love that. I want to do it. I want to do it. And he, and he threw himself into that because that is really the truth. I mean, at the foundational level, when I'm on set with actors and in rehearsals and then on set, what I'm looking for is how they move and how they speak my language. And if possible, achieving a concert of the rhythm of their movement and the rhythm of their dialogue. And like I mentioned before, Parker's key in this, DJ Mendel key in that. But Jeff was, it came to him like nothing. And he, he had a ball doing it. And he actually helped me you know, learn the language about how to talk about that. It's always been much easier for me to deal with actors new actors, people who don't know me, who are coming to work with me for the first time. Um, after that, because Jeff helped me, kind of freed me to just say that. Like, yeah, I need you to say these words, and we've got to find the right rhythm, and I need you to move around in a certain way, and we'll find that, too. We'll find the movements, and we'll find the rhythm. But the words and the movement have to be in concert. They have to, uh, they have to rhyme. Have you ever had a situation where an actor might be uncomfortable with what you're asking them to do, but it's appropriate for the role? And how do you navigate that landscape? They never work for me. They never get the job <laughs> because that's what you try to sort out in the oh, in the um, casting. In the casting, yeah. I mean, has have you had no. that experience where? You really wanted somebody in the film, but you realized that that they didn't get that. Yes, twice, uh, and it was the two most you know painful uh, experiences I've had, and I really learned from it. I couldn't believe it. the second time it happened. I was already like fifteen years into making films, and uh, I did it again. Yeah, you know, I just liked somebody, and. Um, it kind of blocked my ability to see that they didn't have the particular kind of chops that I needed. And that hurt, you know, because I hurt them. You have to fire somebody. That sucked. So, um, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I audition tons of really terrific performers, professional, gifted, curious people. But that doesn't mean that they're right for the kind of work you're doing. What ultimately is your role as a director in working with an actor? Well, in my case, most of the time, I've written the dialogue. Uh, and I have a very strong idea. It's not specific, but it's a strong idea about how the movement is supposed to happen, how the action is supposed to happen. So. So I just need them to feel comfortable giving themselves to those imperatives. Recently, I've been directing a show for Amazon called Red Oaks, which I didn't write. I've been brought on as a director, and I love it. Yeah, and I find that I can use my skills and my even my my temperament and stuff like that just simply by. I see what the words are. I see who the actors are. I did not cast the actors. They're, they're looking for direction. I have an idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if nobody else has an idea, I'll suggest something. And they're like, oh, yeah, great. Okay, we'll do that. And then it really comes down to just trying to make them look as good as possible at every moment. And by good, I mean look good. I mean uh, that they're really in their character. They're having fun embodying that character. They understand the things that they're saying. They understand the situation. A lot of times, given the different things that go on in movie, you know, movie and TV production, a lot of times it's hard to understand. You know, like, you have no idea. Like, why am I, uh, why am I opening this door and going in there? And, you know, sometimes, even as a director, you don't know. <laughs> so you have to, like, ask the writers, like, why is he going through this door? And they don't know. And then, whatever. you you got to make stuff up. You invent. So it's just like this lovely communal 
invention thing. But everybody knows what the story is. It's supposed to be. So you well, just shape it. In looking at your body of work, is there a common theme with your films, even though the films are different, but is there like a kind of a common through line? Uh, some, I don't think it's too strict, but um, yeah, there's a certain position in relation to the world as it is. A certain kind of healthy skepticism, irony, but uh, a certain, I don't know, I guess I would only call it a, a desire to think the best of people. Uh, when the evidence isn't so overwhelming that they're worth it. What are you most proud about in terms of this trilogy? When you when you look at the three films and the music and the book, what what resonates the most with you about this? I think just that I managed to make a move, three movies over the course of almost 20 years with the same actors. You know, one of these actors was five when we made the first film, uh, Liam Aiken. And, uh, you know, by the time we made Faye Grimm in 2006, I wasn't really sure he wasn't really sure if he wanted to grow up. he I think he was like 16 then he wasn't sure if he wanted to continue acting and stuff like that and so you know I had to bite my lip a lot of times I, I tried to meet him up with him like every year or so just to see how he was developing and stuff like that and then because I knew once I made Faye Grimm I knew I would make a third and it would have to be about the fun so I didn't I had to keep an eye on this guy. <laughs> and he, um, by the time he was 20 or 21, it was clear that he was an actor. I mean, he was really working hard at it, and it was gifted, and he had a lot of credits to his name by then. You know, I didn't realize I was starting a trilogy when I made Henry Fool. And, in fact, I, I was very conscientious about making them three very different kinds of films. I didn't want them to to be uh, a series of the same kind of film. I always want my films to provide evidence of a certain time and a certain place in what the world was like at this time. So that was what was exciting about making fake Grimm seven years or whatever it was after Henry Fool was like the world's really different now and what would this woman from Woodside Queens you know if she's looking for her husband Henry of course but what would let's talk about what the world is like right now but use this family um, when I made the first film back in 1990 I shot it in 1996 um, I had no intention of making a, a continuing series of films but, you know, by the time I was finished editing it, I really loved the characters and everything. And I, I joked a lot about making it my own personal Star Wars or something like that. Like this family from Woodside, Queens in New York would become, you know, we could make many, many films about them. That was kind of jokey, but there was something in it. And then uh, a number of years later, almost eight years later, I decided to make a film uh, with Parker Posey based on the character that she originated in that. And then it just started from there. So you know, it took 20 years to make it. Although I own the rights to Henry Fool now, finally, um, and I own the rights to Ned Rifle from the beginning because I financed it myself, I never owned the rights to Fake Grimm. And um, so now... But, and uh, this great company, Magnolia Pictures, here in New York, who control the rights to Faye Grimm forever, uh, they were really great. They just said, wow, no, this is a great idea. You put all three films together in a box set, that's terrific. So, you know, so they, they granted me a license to include Faye Grimm in it. And so that was the real tipping point for me. Once I had their, you know, support, you know, I just set about thinking about the Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> 
how would your career be different if Kickstarter were available 20 years ago? That's an interesting way to put it. I mean, because sometimes I, you know, I think about Kickstarter now. People ask me about using crowdsourcing and stuff like that, and I, I have said this before that it's it's kind of a different version of how I used to finance films in the late '80s and early '90s, where you know I would write a script and then I'd bring it to film distributors and the distributors in each country like the United States England Germany France so on so on each one of them would say well no we like the script and uh, you know if you get this film made you know we'll pay you I don't know say this off the top of my head like you know we'll give you twenty thousand dollars for the rights for like seven years for our country and we'll be able to make as much money as we possibly can in those seven years you know and so what you would do is you would work really hard traveling all over the place at film festivals and stuff and shaking hands all the time and paying for drinks and whatever and you'd finally wind up like you've got a lot of these people lined up who will promise a certain amount of money and they'll put like 10% of that money up front so you could actually make the film. So that's how it worked back then. That doesn't really happen anymore. Kickstarter is kind of a different way. Now I, I kind of go out and say, like, I do my best to describe what I intend to do. And I just ask the people, you know, if I pulled this off, I mean, would you buy this DVD and this CD or a download of that CD and this book or whatever? And... And I'm trying to do it without an enormous promotional budget, which is great. I mean, that's really why I like crowdsourcing. It turns the whole thing kind of on its head, and there, there's a way where you can get into the mass culture's consciousness without having to use these enormously expensive intermediaries who kind of control everything. Now, uh, the plan is to uh, subtitle the film's in five languages, English, Spanish, French, German, and Japanese. I've been doing this, I've been on the road pretty much since 1990, promoting my films all over the world. I realized that that's a big part of it, getting your film translated and subtitled is how you get more people to see them. It's become technologically more efficient and easier to do it since everything's electronic now. But it's still quite expensive, and you've got to be careful. There's still the artistic, creative, craftsman work of interpretation, translation, and all that. Technology hasn't changed that. You really do need somebody to sit down and turn my English into German or Japanese or French or whatever. I see the opportunity right now for me to control all my films all over the world so that I don't need any distributors. I don't need any intermediaries. I can deal directly with my audience all over the world. And, yeah, I can't, like, here's the big thing. Should we subtitle in Portuguese, <laughs> too? Mm. Um, those ones, the, the Japanese, the German, the French, the Spanish, those were the principal languages that my films got distributed in all through the 90s and 2000s. And you have to make a cutoff point somewhere, so mm. that's, where I, that's where I chose. I'm not proficient at any other language other than English, although I know some German, I know some French, I know some Japanese, but it's... It's hilarious to mm -hmm. see people who are really good at this stuff, you know, argue about detail. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, I want that. I, I, you know, I'm, I guess I'm thinking a lot of this is about taking care of my body of work mm -hmm. as I move into the future and I'm getting older. And you know, I've, got this, I've got this whole big body of work <laughs> that I just want to get all tucked into bed nicely, you know, so that, and, and make available to the world, uh, you know, going forward. Um, so I'd like it to be in those different languages and it's all digitally remastered and mixed and all that, uh, you know, and it'll be, it'll be safe and done and on the shelf there for anybody who is curious.
wanted to thank my special guest this evening, Hal Hartley. And if you'd like more information about the Henry Full Trilogy, go to halhartley.com. You can watch a nice video that talks about the films. And also, it's a Kickstarter program, so you can actually be a part of the process, which is very exciting. And just a reminder, you can hear Center Stage every Tuesday night on KXLU Los Angeles, 88.9 FM. You can also find us on the internet at kxlu.com. Until next time, this is Mark Gordon, and I'll see you Center Stage.